So the first question I have for Noelle um, is, and I, I follow her on Instagram, um, Black Abolitionist Newark, and um, I wanted to just have us understand better who were the Black Newark abolitionists that you've spent so much time researching, and can you just tell us a little bit about the time period that they were um, working in Newark and the specific families that you've researched? Sure. So um, thank you, Emily, for inviting me. I'm so happy to be a part of Preservation New Jersey's like first presentation. This is awesome. And I'm just totally like nerding out because it's like all these folks who do what we do, who care about <laughs> historical locations and sites and history are here. So that's so dope. So yeah, as far as like the Black abolitionist community in Newark, when I first started the project, it was just knowing a little bit about the Underground Railroad House um, that's located on Warren. Um, I actually started off um, proposing a project to Rutgers or whoever would support me in my um, proposal to locate four locations or to identify four locations around Newark that I felt were black power sites, right? So mm -hmm. the Queen of Angels Church, which was actually started by a uh, Caribbean and African American women. Mm -hmm. um, the Kenny Hospital, as a lot of folks know, that's over there on Kenny Street, uh, first black hospital in Newark, the Underground Railroad site, um, and another site. So this all actually, I wasn't even thinking about a black abolitionist or activist community um, until I did the proposal and I started doing more research. And then it was really exciting because I was like, okay, um, who were the other folks that were a part of this community? Like it wasn't just one family that was there. So um, as some of you guys know, I'm sure Beth from the library is very familiar because she's been helping the story, you know, helping folks with the story for about three years. Um, so starts with the King family on uh, Warren Street. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I started to realize is that they were actually a community around the whole field. So um, they were connected to other black abolitionists, um, folks like Peter O'Fake. Um, he was a kind of like wealthy black middle class person or wealthy for um, the black middle class at that period in Newark. So there were a good number of families here who were really trying to like fight slavery and fight for the vote. As you know, African American men and women lost the vote in 1807 in New Jersey. So the folks who did make the property requirement could actually vote. Um, and so what happened is one of the contentions we have in New Jersey with the suffrage right and African Americans is that they're trying to get the vote back, right? So you have the O'Fakes, you have the Kings, um, you have the Thompsons, um, and you have several other families that are really trying to advocate for the community by creating churches and creating anti-slavery and voting organizations. Mm, interesting. And now I think um, you sent me a video that I want to bring up on the screen that kind of talks more about this project. So I'm going to share my screen with everyone uh, and bring us to that particular video. Let's see here. Um, and this talks, it gives a little bit more background to what you're talking about in this particular area. So let me yeah, so this is great because you guys can actually see the field that now the Rutgers campus is on um, that was recently renamed Frederick Douglass. It's important to highlight the ways in which people have had to push back to state claim in places. It's important to highlight the ways in which people have had to push back to state claim in places. By us marking this place, marking this place of Black resistance, marking this place of um, African American engagement, we're not only showing folks that this has been a longer fight, but that it's also been a longer win. People. Oh no. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Right. 
Hold on. Sorry, folks. This is exactly what happened yesterday. I thought we would, we would do, do better this time. <laughs> Sorry, let's, let's click out of it. All right. So some folks said they couldn't hear the video. So I'm going to try again. Uh, I'm not sure what that the problem is, um, but it is. I definitely want to make sure we get to see it. So bear with us. <laughs> yesterday we had this situation. Oh, we couldn't see the video, so you probably had to share the screen again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that might be the situation. All right, so let's let's get on that. Let's fix that. Thank you, everyone, for for letting me know. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay. All right. Okay. And now I'm going to. We have some folks in the audience with a lot of experience here. Give me some ideas. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to click from here. You got good? You guys see it? It's important to highlight the ways in which people have had to push back to state claim in places. By us marking this place, marking this place of Black resistance, marking this place of um, African American engagement, we're not only showing folks that this has been a longer fight, but that it's also been a longer win. People have continued to stay and engage. Um, and so that's what I think this story will also do for folks, besides also just correcting the history. <laughs> to, I guess you would call that the south of the field. Um, and he came over from New York and built the first African-American church here in the city. Um, and then obviously he was in connection with other African-Americans, including the Kings who hosted what we now know as one of the confirmed sites of the Underground Railroad here in Newark. And then as I got deeper into the history, um, it just, pulled me in as a story for us to reimagine um, what Black Newark is. We tend to think of the North as a benign space, right? Or even just a safe space for African Americans, um, for the fugitive and slave. But what we come to see is that it was a precarious existence. And what that also implies is that the African Americans were courageous in staying here and creating a space. So we made it through that first hurdle together, guys. We got the video. So that's the only video today. So we shouldn't have that challenge again. But um, oh. <laughs> okay. We had another video come on afterwards, which also sounded interesting. But um, so you know what was interesting to me, um, you know, from that is I've walked by that field a hundred times maybe um and you know had no idea what the history was there um i know there was recently a fredericks douglas field renaming a uh, ceremony that i that they they talk about and i think that was advertising in the video but you know how did you go from um you know there's all these different sites and we'll show some pictures afterwards of of sites that were important to black power in newark but how did um the process actually really occur where you narrowed in on Frederick Douglass Field, which is a sports court kind of in the middle of downtown Newark as part of the Rutgers Newark campus, and decide that this was um, a place to both make art, which we saw some of the art at the at the end of that video, and that again we'll show on some slides later. Um, but how did that that project begin? Oh sure. So mm -hmm. as I as I mentioned earlier, um, I I identify as a black feminist artist. And so as someone who started off as an activist, my work is to really amplify the stories of black activism, right? 
that's existed for over the past like 250 years. So within that context, I had actually, it's kind of funny because I had actually read that Frederick Douglass had visited the church, but it was a part of a larger part of information. So when I approached the chancellor, I was like, oh, we need to like acknowledge this black abolitionist community. And Todd, who lectures often on Frederick Douglass, he had also contacted the chancellor at the same time, and he was like, we need to um, acknowledge that Frederick Douglass visited the campus. So whereas my priorities as a Black activist, <laughs> as a queer Black activist, is to highlight community work um, and Frederick Douglass, um, Rutgers um, has highlighted Frederick Douglass's contribution. And so I guess I'm trying to figure out the way that it happened um it's it was through exploration and reading those different stories like different layers of the stories so um maybe what i'll do is i'll just take people through the images and kind of explain that way sure i'm going to share the screen i'm going to start the slideshow So, so um, we'll actually, so this is actually, some of you guys might um, see uh, here, we'll just, we'll actually start at the first slide. Okay. And we could just kind of like sit on it. Um, so first I have to get a shout out to the New York Public Library um, and also folks, so we have these institutions like New York Public Library and we have other informal kind of arch archivists, historical folks like Old Newark and Newark Street who are all working to keep the, preserve the history of Newark. So this is actually a map from Newark Street. And if you guys look towards the center of the map, I know it might look a little confusing, you'll see that where the Newark Street's um, web developer, he wrote Plain Street. So that's University Avenue. So this is one of the earliest maps that I saw about the space. Um, to the right of the Plain Street, you'll see this H over a building. That's actually like the black church, right? And so then if you, you can kind of have an understanding, this is Warren Street. So one of the first things that I did was kind of like in concert with reading, just all over, right? So I'm reading myths, <laughs> I'm reading historical truths, I'm reading, um, I'm going to Philadelphia, I'm reading about Presbyterian archives there. So what I'm doing is I'm reading various things, looking at different maps and creating information. So uh, thank you, Emily. So Emily's highlighted where the church is. And so what the maps do is they start to give you kind of a sense of how things um, kind of were all together, right? Um, and as folks know, this kind of hedge over here to the left of the church is the uh, Mars Canal. So we can go to the next slide. We can go to number two, cool. So this is, as Beth will probably recognize this map, this is from the New York Public Library. Um, and this is one of their Atlas maps. So we can see the community a little clearer here. So I'm doing readings, so I'm reading um, black newspapers. Um, and I'm, thank you Beth, she sent the link. <laughs> um, and I'm reading black newspapers, I'm reading about Frederick Douglass's visit. But again, I'm reading a whole bunch of sources at the same time. And what becomes clear is I start to see certain names over and over again and certain locations over and over again, which indicated that there was an African-American community there. Um, and then also shout out to Teresa Vega. Um, without Junius Williams and Teresa Vega bringing back the story of the King family, um, this project definitely would have been harder. 
because Teresa Vega has done an immense amount of research around this that has been very helpful. And uh, Junius Williams has a site called Rise Up New York and it provides a great amount of information. So if you guys look at this map, it's a little clearer of what's going on, right? So the church is actually identified as a church on Plain Street. So then what I actually, another resource I use at the library are their directory books. So I can actually look and see. Now this is the, this is actually what was very interesting about like white supremacy and racism is that in the directory, all of the African Americans are marked color, right? So what happens is that by them marking it with colored, we're able to track where the African Americans lived in New York. So um, I get to see that, say a lot of Af where it says 249 in that area, lots of African Americans live there. Um, and then I can also see going up Warren Street. So we can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. And just a reminder, Plain Street is University Avenue now. And Hackett Street, if the folks from Rutgers, that is the small street by the um, building next to the field. So um, now a part of this process is bringing together bits and pieces of information. So six years ago, I had writ read about African Americans who had left First Presbyterian Church um, as um, an act of rebellion or civil disobedience. Because what was happening at First Presbyterian Church is they were, they were having African Americans either stand by the windows or stand in the balconies. Um, and this was actually a practice that took place all over the country in the 1820s, 1830s, going all the way up to the 1860s. And basically, um, they would have African Americans either stand, sit in the basement, or sit in remote balcony areas. Now, First Presbyterian Church is the oldest church in Newark, and um, one of the, I, I had actually worked with Junius Williams, and one of the things um, Junius had asked me to research was this whole concept of Harriet Tubman coming to Old First. And as I continued to dig deeper into that story, it actually gave me more clues. Um, one thing that we learned was that probably Harriet Tubman did not visit the church because of the fact that the church was primarily a white supremacist site, meaning they supported the colonization movement, they segregated blacks at the church, and learning this story or revisiting the story again about the African Americans who left the church in protest in 1832 really started putting a glue into my story. So next slide. So you guys saw a little bit of this video in, the, um, I mean, a little bit of this picture in the video. Um, and basically, um, this is a picture from 1920, where they were remembering again that this had been an underground railroad site. So we're lucky because we have um, three archival sources that point to um, this site being an archival site. So one of the being an underground railroad site, which is very rare in New Jersey because generally people have to rely on hearsay. And we actually have a newspaper from, even though this is about 50 years after the um, underground railroad would have been um, you know, possible at the house, um, is that we actually have an article from 1850 where they're talking about that the man who owned this house, Jacob King, was actually the president of the Relief Society, which was a society to help underground railroad fugitives. So we're able to make these various connections. And now at Rutgers, we're actually applying for a heritage site. Um, so basically just to have the site marked, um, and so we're going to be presenting my research um, so we can mark it as a heritage site. But it's just amazing. And just as a side note, I mean, the African Americans and Jacob King's family, along with the Thompsons, those were his um, in-laws, um, they built this house. <laughs> they built this three-floor house. And 
one of the things that Teresa Vega does in her work is look a little bit more into who, where they might have gotten their money, where they came from. And actually, um, the Thompsons were owned by a man named Henry Beast, who actually had a plantation in North Carolina. Um, and he came to Newark and he freed three of his enslaved people here in Newark, but the 200 in North Carolina were still enslaved. Wow. Wow, it's, an, it's amazing how you wove all these pieces together and found people's names in, in all these records. All right, I'm gonna move to the next slide here. Yeah, well, it requires a whole bunch of people working on things. So basically when I started the project, I didn't have any images of the churches besides the one that's at North Public Library, New Jersey Historical Society, which is the Underground Railroad House. So um, luckily I was able to um, find this image at the New Jersey Historical Society, not this image, sorry, a picture of the church. So this was a picture of the Plain Street Colored Church after it had been kind of um, destroyed not destroyed, but it had deteriorated, right? Um, and this is important when we think about preservation. It was a very, maybe it was around the 19, I think it's around the 1920s that the church was deteriorating and the members didn't want to move. You know, they wanted to stay in the church. But what's great is that we have a picture of the church. And this is actually where it would have been located on the Frederick Douglass Field. So what I did, um, as a part of an art, as being a, oh, as a part of being an artist um, and, and my public humanities work, is I did a mashup of a contemporary picture of the field. And there's this little boy who's unsuspectingly in my picture. <laughs> and, He's um, traveling. Who knows yeah. one day maybe he'll recognize himself. And then I juxtaposed it with an image of the church and a girl, it's an archival image of a girl at an African-American school, um, at the girl from an African-American school in the South. So, and I also like illuminated her shirt so we could see that learning and reading were as important to the Black abolitionist struggle as um, doing the anti-slavery work. So just to um, explain, there was a girls' school and a boys' school at the church, even though the girls' school was there longer. Um, but it's just amazing to be able to see the institution um, and to have folks see that it was on the field. Mm -hmm. And Noel, this is a question um, regarding this specific area. So. I know that the field has been renamed Frederick Douglass Field, but I thought that at one point there was also going to be some physical manifestation where people would be able to see that it was associated with uh, the Newark abolitionists. Yeah, so we're, we're working on that memorial now. <laughs> It'll probably be um, probably two more years before it materializes, but we're just figuring that out now. So our next step is marking it as a heritage site in the Underground Railroad. Got it. Great. Okay. So in this picture, it's another example of kind of a recreation that I did. Um, this is on Clinton, Clinton Street. Um, some of you might recognize it. Um, it's near the Gateway Center and Mulberry Place. So what I've done with this image is this was a call this was called the first free church. Um, people also called it the quote, nigger church, end quote, because it was a place where white abolitionists, like pictured here, I have Theodore Weld, and I also have, um, uh, I believe it's Charles Beecher or Henry Beecher. I get them confused because one was doing abolitionist work in Brooklyn and one was doing work here. And these are white abolitionists from the period who actually would hold meetings in this space. Um, that was a very contentious space for the white people in Newark um, because they were basically organizing. And this is Angelina Grimke, 
who's in the left, some of you may know or some of you may not know that the Grim Case sisters actually lived in Newark in Belleville and the Oranges. So generally when we think of the Grim Case sisters, it's rare that we think of them connected to Newark, but there we even have this quote from, from Angelina where she's saying, Newark is the spot to be, right? Which was the next level of my research because I was like, why is Grimke saying that Newark is the place to be? Um, and what does this mean? And that's because Newark had a strong investment in slavery in the South because we exported a lot of goods for um, plantations. So we exported something called Negro shoes, um, which I'm actually developing a project about right now. Um, so, so when we, it's interesting because when we think about these stories in Newark, right, um, one of the things that comes up is you're rewriting it, right? So we think about patent leather, we think about people making shoes, but rarely do we think about that the shoes that were being made were, um, that some of them, a large amount of them, were for enslaved people in the South. Um, machine parts for sugar machines, for, for making um, sugar, were also constructed near um, McCarter Highway. So the reason why Grim K is like, well, Newark is the place to be is because in Newark, um, the white supremacists here, even though they would often say they were anti-slavery, they also were very defiant about allowing the South, South um, believing that the South should have the right to enslave people. And there's actually like a meeting that the folks have here in Newark in the 1840s where they say, well, actually slavery didn't even start in the South. It, start, it started here in the North. <laughs> That's how far they went to justify um, stabilizing the economy in Newark. And um, one author, Addison Atkinson, he actually describes Newark as the Southern workshop. Interesting. Yes, I, I've been uh, somewhat aware through um, the tours that I, I also run about how there was a, a number of yeah, Confederate sympathizers in Newark more than other cities surrounding us because of just, just what you said, the shoe industry and how much was being exported to the South. Really interesting. And I didn't know about the Grimke sisters being in Newark at all but I do see uh, the sister here in the image. Who's yeah, and I just, want to, I just want to go back for a second. I want yeah. to be clear, folks, that this is a, I've recreated this. So these are images I actually found of Theodore Weld and Angelina Grinke that I've inserted into a photo shoot that I did in downtown Newark. And this building over here is the church as it looked, right? This is exactly where it was situated on the street. So what I'm doing with the gold is kind of showing these um, kind of spaces that were like treasured um, and that are a part of our history and fighting for human rights juxtaposed. It was called the first free church um, that, that are juxtaposed against the contemporary buildings so that for the folks who are here, they can walk down the street and imagine these places. Mm. So basically this um, here, so basically I went from a point of only knowing about one space to finally creating kind of a map or a model of the community. Um, so one of the things that's really interesting is that over here to the left on Academy Street, where for the folks who are actually from Newark or you are familiar, that's the parking lot by Essex County College, right? That's by Raymond Boulevard. So basically the first African-American church was here um, by Raymond Boulevard. And the back of the church was actually facing the Mars Canal. Then as we come around the canal, we have the second African-American church which is the Plain Street Color Church that Frederick Douglass would visit. So actually the visit that Rutgers commemorates um, for Frederick Douglass, he actually came one day to one church, came in, did a speech, and then he went to another church. And for folks who don't know anything about Frederick Douglass, is he's a very like cantankerous fellow. And apparently some of the black churches in Manhattan 
had wanted to charge uh, Frederick Douglass, they're like, look, you know, you're Frederick Douglass. You can pay money <laughs> to do your speech here. And the folks at Plain Street Colored Church, they didn't charge him any money or get any money from him. So he says, you know, he's like, thank you to the people in Newark for being so kind and gracious, unlike these other people. He's a very feisty guy. And even when thinking about the African corner or the nigger pew, like, what was happening at First Presbyterian Church. Um, there's an example in Boston where African Americans were actually forced to sit behind a wall with a slit in it on the balcony of the church to watch services. But speaking of Frederick Douglass, he would actually kind of flip sides on the whole concept of whether Blacks should form their own churches or whether we should stay in the churches and fight for our rights, you know? Um, so at first he felt like, you know, African Americans needed to stay in the churches and fight for their rights. But then as this nigger view and African view continued, um, Douglas was forced to say, you know, maybe forming our own churches is better, you know? And he was, you know, the amazing thing about Douglas, and I think it's a model for us now, is that he had a certain flexibility to his thought. Like, what, what is the mo most appropriate response right now? You know, very passionate, but also always thinking. Um, so Douglas was able to visit both of these sites. Now, what I didn't mention in this talk is that over here, because I'm trying not to overload you guys with too much information, but to the back of the church on Academy Street is actually a model for the Christopher Rush House. Um, you saw a little bit of him in the video. He's a, he's a reverend who comes from New York and he buys this property here. He also buys the property, thank you, Emily, where it says four. Um, um, he buys that property there. He's actually the one who sells it to the Kings. Um, and he establishes, he, he works with the African Americans in Newark to establish the first church on Academy Street, okay? Um, so then of course, this expanded my research, right? Because what you see in the text is that they're like, you know, Christopher Rush didn't come here and start this from New York. He came and he joined with the community here in Newark. So what that helped to do was to continue to substantiate the work. Um, and some of you may know, some of you may not know, the AME Zion Church is now, or was a little famous then, um, for being a place of refuge for African Americans fleeing the South. So one of the ways scholars, um, I wish I had her book with me here now, we're rethinking the AME Zion Church is that wherever you have an AME Zion Church, you most likely have an underground railroad spot. So the way you should think of these black churches, the AME Zion Churches, is that these are institutions, right? And what happens is when we are able to visually look at it, we can actually see how the community was. So Teresa Vega and I believe Denise Williams both theorized that over here where the building is the number four, um, where Jacob King's house is, is that he also had a shed back there um, which he stored his horses. His father-in-law, um, Tom Thompson Thomas, Thomas Thompson, he was a carriage driver. He would often drive to New York, he would drive um, to Philadelphia, and Teresa Vega and Junius Williams have theorized that this car these carriage drivers, particularly the Thompsons, were assisting um, fugitive enslaved. Hmm. Now we're pushing that theory in more, as you folks probably saw in Harriet Tubman, is they're really moving towards a more truthful underground railroad narrative. First, that African Americans were one of the strongest forces in helping and assisting other African Americans to escape the South. Mm -hmm. Second, that people were not always work walking, that they were using, um, they were hiding in carriages and other things. 
um, later on, they were on trains. Um, and But what we get to see visually with this map, and that is why recreating or visually creating these visual pieces, um, it helps to for us to understand how it worked. So if we were to accept um, Vega theory and Williams' theory, it would be that this wall that existed almost acted as like a cover for folks who would go into the King House. Um, the Christopher Street House being perpendicular also helped it. And then it was right behind the Plain Street Colored Church. So, and then um, I didn't speak about this, but this is St. Philip's Church, which is now located exactly where the Paul Robeson Center is at Rutgers. So basically Rutgers campus was the black abolitionist <laughs> community in New York, right? Which, you know, it, it gives us a lot to think about, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'll stop there. So, cause, cause I could do this for four more hours. So, <laughs> well, that's, that's great. We, are, <laughs> we are coming up on our um, time when we want to allow audience um, Q and A. Um, so I, I think there's a couple folks that have asked questions already. If anybody has other questions, please feel free to use the Q and A section. Um, but one of the questions that has come through um, the chat um, is from Susan um, Newberry. Um, she was asking if um, 70 Warren Street, does that uh, structure still exist in that site? No, none of these structures exist. Hmm. So currently the church to the left, over here on Academy Street, that's a parking lot for Essex County College. Mm -hmm. All the buildings in the middle, that's Rutgers alumni field. So that's University Avenue running in front of it. And the church at the top of the hill, which some of you may be familiar with, it was St. Philip's Church. These are the African Americans who left Trinity Church, right? So you have some people of color, multiracial people of color, who also established St. Philip's Church. I think often folks forget about St. Philip's Church because of the fact that I believe they had um, white spiritual leadership in the beginning, even though the blacks would serve in other capacities like deacons and things like that. Um, it was a small church and it's exactly where the Paul Robeson Center. So none of these structures exist. And this is a map that I created from combining all these different sources. That's interesting, Noel. And, and so is this, I'm just going to circle on the map, make sure, is this St. Philip's Church? That, that was the St. Philip's Church. So basically, uh, the African Americans, they left Trinity Church, which I believe is the second um, oldest church after First Presbyterian on Broad Street, mm -hmm. and they established their own church. Is this um, where St. Philip's Academy is now? Or... That's where the Paul Robeson oh, Paul um, Center is. It's across from NJIT. Got it. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's interesting how you use the art because it otherwise you you literally couldn't imagine because um, for folks on the call that haven't been to this part of Newark, it's it's campuses, right? Um, we have a great question here uh, in the Q and A from Kathy Heim. Um, Did the construction of the Morris Canal impact the Black community and churches? Well, I'm, I'm going to assume that even though Christopher Rush, like one thing I spent a, a good couple of weeks on <laughs> was trying to figure out if Christopher and Rush knew that the Mars Canal was going to be built there before he purchased land there. Um, and I'm not able to make that assessment. I, I believe, and feel free to correct me, I believe the Mars Canal was created in 1834. And uh, Christopher Rush had purchased land there almost like six years earlier. Now there is the idea that he could have known about the plans um, because one theory is that some of these underground railroad stops are near transportation areas, right? Um, and even though folks don't really talk about it that much, some people believe that um, there were often folks who escaped um, through the Mars Canal, right? Um, that's that's been hard for me to substantiate, but it's still worthy worthy of my millions of hours staying up. <laughs> so I'm still pursuing it. Plus, Jersey City, they actually have a sculpture in New York Stage Place that states that. Um, 
So I would, I would love to crack that case um, to know if there was a connection. So another thing we have to remember is that there's a, a hill here. So African Americans were often offered places to purchase that were on hills um, near water sources, less desirable areas. So um, like Christopher Rush being able to buy two properties or a whole land plot there, um, it was, you know, it was an opportunity. Um, and then the fact that they were able to, he was also able to buy this land for the church um, is also a significant fact. It just shows how AME Zion Church was working to establish these churches in key areas all across the country, particularly in Newark. And Newark is actually one of the earliest churches. I believe it's the third church in the area. It's definitely the first church um, in Newark and in the Essex County area. Mm, interesting. Um, another question. Um, so and it kind of relates back to actually the theme of, of the talk, which is you know, historic preservation when the structure is gone. Um, how do you, what's your kind of goals um, in terms of preserving both the memories and the, any uh, physical environments that are, that are, are left in Newark related to uh, Newark's, you know, uh, black power history? Um, and how do you feel like you're creating your art? Um, it kind of relates, relates to that and strengthens historic preservation in the city. So basically, I was. So basically, you're asking, what is my goal? Mm -hmm. you know, my goal. Art. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I mean, just um, again, I I I'm a queer black feminist thinker, and you know, just I'll just backtrack for a second. Starting out in my teens, I was reading stuff like Alice Walker in Search of Our Mother's Garden, right? So for folks who aren't familiar, basically Alice Walker looked for Zora Neale Hurston. So Zora Neale Hurston, a lot of us would not even be familiar with her if Alice Walker didn't go to the South, find her grave, do the research, help to bring her book back. So in a lot of ways for me, Black feminism is reclaiming history. So even though Alice Walker, she's a poet, she's also an activist. Um, and she also reclaims history. Um, and also living here in Jersey City and Newark and not being directly connected to the Black Arts Movement, but being indirectly connected to it through my family, um, this tie between art and history is, it's, it's preeminent. I mean, it's just you, to me, it's, um, it's always connected. And so for me, um, my work as an artist is, lifting the voices of your ancestors to empower how we think about ourselves today. Often the story that's told with abolitionists is that they're white, they're rich people who saved African Americans. What we see over the past couple of years, even in the media, even with Harriet Tubman, is taking that narrative and showing how black activism is a three century affair and that the poorest people were helping African Americans. This this empowers African Americans in their ideas of citizenship now, and it also empowers them in thinking in us of thinking of our next steps um, and how we want to be citizens in this country or community members, whichever word you like to use. Mm, amazing. We have another question here um, from Melanie B. Can the public view and engage with this history and artwork on site? At a, at a site or on site? On, on any of the sites. It, it, can they engage with any of the images that you've shown at this moment? Oh, okay. So I have some images on my site, um, noellelorainewilliams.com. If you go to like the African, I think it's the African American um, Rebellion. I'm not sure how I've marked that tab. I have some images there. Uh, but feel free to send me your email because then I can keep you up to date. Um, I often post on my Black Abolitionist New York page. But that's a combination of what's going into the exhibition and also contemporary issues and how the history impacts what we're doing today. 
you know? So for example, with the mayor's removal of the Christopher Columbus statue, um, even though that doesn't directly tie to black abolitionist work, um, I explore that on the Instagram page, but please email me and I'll add you to my email list so I can tell folks about what's happening at Rutgers. And also this exhibition will be at um, Newark Public Library next February, 2021. Oh, fantastic, that's great to know. Um, we have one more question and then we'll start the, the wrap up. Um, we have a, a, a question about the date of AME Zion uh, in Newark. When was that constructed? Yeah, I'll, I'll say 1826 because I don't have the notes in front of me. Um, but it was several years prior to the Plain Street Color Church, which was the first church that Douglas visited. Um, so I would say around 1826, they created the church. Now the difference between the AME Zion Church and the Plain Street Color Church is that the AME Zion Church was purchased by African Americans and created by it. Um, Plain Street was, um, it was partially purchased by African Americans, but also the lot was also contributed to by Theodore Freelandhausen. Um, Freelandhausen. And even exploring his history um, has enriched my understanding of this community a lot. Um, one of the things I see is that Freeland Heisen, he donated the church, but then I came to find out he was the vice president of the colonization movement to send African Americans back to Africa. And there was always this debate about the colonization movement that they were trying to help folks. But even as we read Freeland Heisen's wor words, we get to see how he had a negative perception and promoted a negative perception of African Americans, even though there were people like Samuel Cornish who founded the first African-American newspaper in um, the United States. Samuel Ward, who did activism here and who actually is one of the um, folks that helped with the Jerry's rescue, you know, to help a, a fugitive enslaved person just um, escape. You know, um, Henry Drayton, who uh, lived in North Carolina and came up here to organize, you know. These are all folks that Freeland has knew, but still he was propagating negative imagery of Blacks. So it's a very tricky space with this research and it's very fine. So like, you know, folks will be like, great, Freeland has and he donated, you know, the church to the African Americans. But then we learned that these folks who were segregationists and colonizationists, they often did these things to keep people separate. It's interesting to try and yeah, research the intentions all these years um, back and that you're able to find find these um, you know really differing actions versus words and viewpoints. What I wanted to ask is one last question we have here in the Q&A. Somebody asked me a technical question. How did you create this? <laughs> so, so basically the way I created that is like uh, through the images that Emily showed you. So um, I have a consultant that I work with. Um, so basically those maps. So, okay, so this is, this is great. I have pictures of, well, go back one more. Um, so like I have a picture of the church here. So I, I know the shape of it and I've also read documents that tell me what the size of it is, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I have that, you know, um, I have the map. I give instructions to the person who worked on the model. It was, it was a very layered process. Um, and, but it's worth it because what it does is it expands the history of black activism in Newark beyond or before the 1930s. And it shows how we contributed to how democracy is thought of in this country and in this city. But um, that's, that's my shortest answer <laughs> on how I put it together. So basically I took um, dimensions from the notes, I took um, images that I found, and then I took those maps that we showed you earlier and I plotted it out and then someone created the 3D structures. Mm, fantastic, great. All right, so we're about to wrap up. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to, um, first of all, I wanna thank Noel for spending so much time with us answering um, all the fantastic questions here in the group. 
Also want to thank her for being the first person to jump into the Q&A with PNJ Water. So we had a couple technical challenges, but I think we worked through them together. So thank you, Noelle, for that. Um, and um, yeah, can I say one more thing, Emily? Mm -hmm. uh, just quickly, before I even had these maps, I walked the land. And when I had the maps, I walked the land. You have to walk the land to have a deeper understanding of the community and history. That's how you become more intimate with the story. And that's how you're able to make connections. Sorry, Emily, I, that, that, that my girlfriend just reminded me. That's really like where it all really started. No, I, I, I love that and I agree. And uh, yeah, it's actually been hard uh, taking on this role uh, when basically when the pandemic began, I haven't had the chance to visit some of the sites um, and, and get out there as much as I would like to. Cause I believe, I believe in that and seeing the site, walking the site, talking to people um, is just so important uh, in historic preservation. All right, so um, again, thank you so much, Noelle. Um, again, she was the first one to jump in here with us. We have some people saying that they love the talk in the, in the chat room. So thank you, everyone. Um, I know some folks were not able to um, message uh, the other attendees as I had thought um, would be possible. So if there's someone that you'd like to be connected with, um, you know, I'd be happy to kind of check with that person and make that e intro. Um, so just let me know. Um, you can, you know, mention it in the chat box or also um, you can um, mention it. Uh, you can email me. Uh, I will read info at preservationnewjersey.org. I do want to do one more kind of plug about what Preservation New Jersey is all about. Um, we do have uh, family memberships, individual memberships, educational programming like this, which is brand new. We do tours when times are good and you can go outside. We do our 10 most endangered historic places list um, that was released just a couple months ago. We have a quarterly newsletter business industry network for people that want to network with other um, business owners in preservation. And we also do the Preservation Leadership Awards, which will be announced on July 23rd. So a lot of ways to get involved. Definitely want uh, to, you know, see uh, more folks, um, you know, getting involved with all our events and joining us. And, um, and also I want to plug our next talk, uh, Q&A with PNJ. So we'll be with uh, Joe Grabus who will be talking about land records as a historic resource. Um, and I think, you know, from this, it's actually a, a nice segue from the talk we had today, because it sounds like with the maps, um, it was really one of the first steps in Noel's process and understanding the, the land itself and the ownership of, of that land. So, um, so we will wrap it up there. Thank you again, Noel, and uh, thank you everyone who joined us on this, on this first journey and for all your your supportive words. <laughs> All right. And feel free to connect with Noelle. That's why we have her email address here and her website so that I see some people in the chat saying that they want to follow up. And that's, that's wonderful. That's what we hope to happen after these Q and A's with PNJ. So, all right, everyone have a great afternoon and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's awesome. Thanks. <laughs>